Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 85 this morning, and that's where we're going to uh, kind of kick off there, but we're not going to stay there. It's going to be a little different today than, than usual. You know, usually I'll, I'll get a passage, and we'll kind of exegete it and work through it and pull principles out, but uh, just that psalm is going to kind of be a, just a, a launching point for us today, just kind of a maybe an object lesson for us to look at, and then we're going to look at some uh, principles today, some ways that we can avoid... Uh, you know, de uh, destroying or sabotaging our revival before it even starts. So three ways uh, to kill a revival. We're going to be looking at those things. And uh, as you all know that we do have revival meetings that will be starting uh, this Thursday night at 7 o'clock, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, 7 o'clock, and then Sunday morning will be homecoming. So uh, we look forward to this time of year. Um, and we invite you to invite guests, and but just be preparing your hearts to continue this week. Uh, the last three weeks on Wednesday nights, instead of having a regular prayer meetings, we've had cottage prayer meetings, and we've had great attendance, and we've had uh, 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 what I feel has been very beneficial to us. I think that we've uh, examined our hearts uh, uh, to an extent, and we've been working to, to uh, you know, to, to see where we're at spiritually and, and, and truly desiring uh, to be revived by the Lord, and so those have been great. And uh, if you know me, when I say, I don't say that we have revival this week i don't use that word I, I say revival meetings that's what i say because it's just a a meeting with the hopes that revival happens because we can meet and revival not happen right we can do that we can just like we can come here every sunday and say we're having church but we don't have church right you can just come here and just attend and you'll never have church you'll never have any spiritual connection or movement of, of god in this place at all and so uh, it really depends on our attitude and, and, and what we're desiring to, to have accomplished in that time so if we desire for revival to happen so uh, this whole idea of scheduling revivals is, is I'm, I'm new to this and so uh, we, we we have it on our calendar and it's every year at, at homecoming leading up to homecoming we schedule revival but listen, if we could really schedule revival, would we not do it all the time? It would be continuous. It wouldn't just be, you know, right here at this time of the year. So, uh, again, it goes back to our hearts, our attitudes, and, and, and what we desire of God on a daily basis to revive us daily. So the first question for us to, to, to get on the same page here is what is revival anyway? Right? What is revival anyway? To, to think about, because we, we use that word and, I, and, and we, we throw it around and we have a revival here and revival there. And what exactly does it mean? Revival is for uh, the purpose of renewing and restoring and redirecting, refocusing the people of God. Right? It, it's to remind us of who we are, to remind us of our purpose and, and all these things, to remind us that we are the beloved of God, His special people. We're the adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God, the King of Kings, that we are fully loved and that we are fully forgiven, that we are a missional people that are called to share the gospel. Right? That's what revival is all about. Because sometimes, sometimes, if you're like me, I'll confess for me, I get distracted. I get distracted, and I, and, I, and I forget what I'm here for. I, 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 I lose sight of the, the victory that I have in Christ, and I let the, 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 the flesh take over, and I start making bad decisions, and I start you know, doing this, and my priorities get out of whack, and next thing you know, everything's out of whack. And so I need revival. I need revival in my life as much as you need revival in your life. See, we lose sight of these things quite often. It's why so many of us get discouraged, right? When we think about the, in Sunday school lesson this morning, we talked about having victory. And so many times that we, we lose sight of who we are in Christ and we, we, we are discouraged because the enemy gets into our head. And that, that we, uh, so many of us believe the, uh, the lies that the enemy would tell us, that we aren't loved and that we have, uh, we've gone too far and that, that God can't forgive that sin and that you're, you're not pleasing to the Lord and all these things and start working on us and wearing us down. We start thinking these things and believing these things. And many of us have just, let's just be honest, have grown bored and stagnant in our relationship with Jesus Christ, Right? grown bored and stagnant see all these things are, 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 are happening because we need revival if you're if you're bored in your christianity right if you're stagnant in your walk with jesus christ listen you need revival you need reviving you need to be re-energized and refocused so you know, let me just tell you this i think this is what's happened to some of us this is why some of us are bored and some of our relationship with jesus is stagnant that we have made this we have made the sunday morning gathering the end game of christianity we have made getting here 
the most important thing about Christianity. Like, if you're a Christian, the most important thing you'll do is to get in this room on a Sunday morning. And that's not it. That's not it. No, no it's important. We, we gather. We need to be here. We need to be here as often as we possibly can. But this is not the end. See, the, 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 this is not the goal. It falls way too short. See, there, there is a lost and dying world right outside those doors. See those two white doors? Lost and dying world right outside those two doors. And we're called to reach them with the gospel. Right? And, and then we invite them into our faith family that we have received this great commission. So that's what we're here for. So who is revival for? Right? Who is revival for? It, it, revival is for saved people. Right? It, it's, it's for saved people. Sometimes we get this confused and, and, and we confuse a, a crusade, an evangelistic crusade with a revival. And they're two different things. They're, they're, they're two different goals uh, to be achieved revival is for saved people lost people do not need revive lost people need to be vived right they need to be made alive for the first time they don't need to be revived they need to be vived the first time and so uh, that's the difference they need to be made alive in christ and so for revival is for those that have repented of their sins and have placed their faith in jesus christ and 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 like i've already said have kind of started to struggle and starting to grow weary in our battles with the flesh and, and on and on i could go See, a revival uh, is, is, is not the same as an evangelistic crusade. And so sometimes we do get those mixed up a little bit. But let me say this. If someone realizes that they're lost in the midst of a revival, amen. Amen. I, I, I would love to see people come to know that, man, I've been playing a game. I've been playing along. I've been coming to church all my life. And I finally realize now that I've just been playing a game. I finally realize the Holy Spirit has convicted me of my sin and my lostness. And I would love to see people get saved in the midst of a revival. But see, that's not the whole point of revival. Revival is for saved people. For saved people. That, 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 but God will tend to save people even in the midst of revival. So this morning, as I've already said, will be a, a little bit different uh, for us. as We're going to look at this passage. And uh, I'm going to read through this psalm for us uh, as, as a reference point. And then I'm going to give you these three ways that we can uh, avoid to, to kill the revival that we hope to receive. So, and, and I, listen, I'm going to say this, and you're probably going to laugh at me. I do not plan on going as long as usual because I, I plan on adding on some extra time at the end for I just want us to spend some time uh, uh, searching our hearts and, and repenting of sin and confessing sin and whatever we need to do to continue to prepare our hearts. And so that's my plan for today's uh, uh, service. So let me pray for us, and we'll uh, get to it. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the gift of grace. We thank you for the gift of forgiveness. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that today uh, would be a day like no other. God, I pray that today you would do some serious work in each of our hearts. Father, that uh, for those that are struggling, God, that that are are searching for wisdom, God, that you would provide that wisdom. Lord, for those that are are, are playing games with you, Lord, that are, that are, are pretending to be something that they're not, God, I pray that today you would reveal uh, those games father for those that are are uh, are struggling hard with sin father i pray that today that you would give them the strength to break free of that sin god i pray that you would just help us today to examine our hearts father we need revival desperately father we we may think that we're okay and we may think that we're doing just fine but lord if we were just to truly uh, to see ourselves the way that you see us father we need revival So, God, help us today. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us to prepare the way for you to change us, to mold us, to make us be the the people that you want us to be, to be the church that you have created us to be. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So go ahead and grab your Bible and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to look at Psalm 85, uh, 1 through 9. And this is a a pretty common passage that's used uh, during uh, revival meetings. It says, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. Here's the key. 
but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that gl the glory may dwell in our land. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. When we read our Bibles, the Israelites are a great uh, object lesson for us, a, a great example of how God would send revival uh, uh, upon his people, and then his people would turn right back around. And, and, and return to the same way they were doing before, doing the same things that made them need revival in the first place. And before we are too critical of them, I would say that we are very similar, amen, that we'll do the same thing because it's, it's, it, it can happen, and it may have happened in the past, and it can happen again this time, that we can meet for revival, and we can be fired up, and we can be redirected and refocused, and then Monday morning roll around. And then what happens? We, we turn and go right. We, 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 it's like we never, we never heard uh, uh, anything anyone said during the revi revival meetings, and we just turn right, we're around and fall back in the same hole that we just climbed out of. See, that, we, that, that we're just creatures of habits, and that's just the way humanity is. And it's okay if it's a good habit, right? Not, not all habits are bad. If it's a good habit, it's a, it's a good thing. But if it's a bad habit, it's definitely a bad thing. And sometimes even having revival meetings uh, can become just a habit, right? It can become just something that, yeah, that you do, that you put it on the church calendar, and then here it comes again, and here it comes again, and here it comes again. And if you've been a member here for 40, 50 years, this might be the, the 50th annual homecoming revival that you've been a part of. And it can become something that it's like celebrating Mother's Day or Father's Day or, or any other just thing on the calendar. And I pray that that's not, it will never get that way in your hearts, but there is possible. See, some churches uh, schedule revival all the time, and some churches never schedule revivals. And see, right now in our little corner of the world, if you drive around, this is revival season. It seems like because it's everybody. I mean, I'll, I'll come here, and there'll be uh, a little paper stuff in the doorknob and stuck on the doors and pinned everywhere and revival here and revival there. And, you know, maybe we should get together and coordinate, and we could just have them like once a month because we could because everybody's doing them at the same time, and we could just cover the whole year with revivals. But see, what that does is tells us that either we're just doing it because that's what we've always done, or it's something in our hearts that reveals to us that we all need revival because we all keep seeking to have these revival meetings, right? And so uh, whatever the reason is that, that we know, we all knew that we need to have revivals. And so let me be clear. Uh, I am all for revival meetings, right? Don't hear me knocking revival meetings. Don't hear me saying that, you know, we shouldn't do this or I'm against that. I am all for having revivals. But listen, let me put some, let me put some, uh, some clauses on here. I'm all for having revival meetings only if we're truly meeting to be revived by the Spirit of God. That's it. Only if we're truly meeting to be revived by the Spirit of God. Only if we're not just meeting so we can hear our favorite preachers preach. Right? Only if we're not meeting for that. Because I've had lots of people ask me, who's coming? And you know what I've told you? Don't worry about it. I haven't told anybody who, who's coming. I'm not, I haven't mentioned anybody's names and, and because it shouldn't matter, should it? It shouldn't matter who it is. It shouldn't matter who the preacher is. If you want to be revived, be here, right? That, and that's just, the way, that's just the way it is. We'll, we'll have revival meetings only if we're not just meeting so we can bring in some fancy gospel sing group, singing group to entertain us. You understand what I'm saying? And so, so these, these things can be perverted and turned into just another religious activity where we have our favorite speakers and we have more of our, 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 our music that we enjoy listening to, and we're not revived at all. We're just entertained, right? That's, that's the problem with sometimes what happens in revivals, that many uh, people would, would, would just come because of, uh, well, I like such and such. I love to hear brother so-and-so, and oh, I love their music. Their music's so great. I'm just so blessed every time I hear it. Well, good. Buy a CD. Right, buy a CD and you can listen to it every day on your way back and forth to work. And so for us, as we gather as the people of God, we want to be revived. If you're truly interested in being revived, then, then you'll be here regardless of who's, who's going to be preaching. Right? Just trust your pastor that I've prayed and sought out the men that God would have. Come and speak to our hearts and just be here and be ready to be blessed. Be ready to receive uh, what the Lord would, would have for you to hear. So how can we prevent ourselves? How can we present ourselves from sabotaging this revival uh, uh, before it even starts? The first way that we can kill revival here at Occupy Number 2 is we just go through the motions. 
right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Just going through the motions, just going through the motions, the, the rituals that uh, as, as much as we tend to, to, to look in our Bibles and read our Old Testaments and look at the Jews and this, all, the, the, all the rituals and routines and the things they do, all the traditions, we do the very same things, don't we? We'll do the very same things, that we're locked into these traditional things and the things we've always done, and, and we'll just keep doing them over and over and again, you know, that, that we'll just do the same thing over and over again. The, the things that started out with it for the right reason and were a wonderful thing that were filled with passion now are just cold, dead, traditional religious activities. No passion for God, no desire for God to move in your life, but just that's just what we do. Because that's what the calendar says. Because we last year we did it, and we're going to do it this year. And guess what? Next year, Lord willing, we're going to do it again next year because it's on the calendar. Where's the passion? Where's the passion? Where's the desire to see God move? It's just not just an event on the calendar that we desire to see God move in our lives. The, 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 the passion must return. The, the passion to see God transform our lives. Not just a mere formality of what you do because it's on the calendar. It's that same old checkbox Christianity mentality. Check, check, check. Sunday school, check. Worship service, check. Discipleship training, check. Evening service, check. Midweek prayer service, check. Ladies Bible study, check. Revival, check. Homecoming, check. That's not what God desires. Where's the passion? Where's the love? You don't, we don't do this out of duty. We do this out of love. It should be. Not out of, out of obligation, but a true desire from our hearts. That we don't, that, that, that unfortunately, many times, we really don't expect God to show up, and we really don't even care if He shows up. Right? We're just going through the motions. And that's what we want to warn ourselves about. Don't do that. Don't just go through the motions. Here's a test for you. To, to, you know, do you have, uh, uh, do you do what you do because you genuinely love Jesus, right? That's a good question to ask yourself. Do you do what you do because you genuinely love Jesus? That, that's a heart that is, I want to. I want to do these things. I, I want to be in Sunday school. I, I want to serve the, the, the body of Christ. I, I want to give my money to, to missions, right? I want to do these things, not I have to. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a different type of heart. Or... Do you do what you do because you're doing what you think you're supposed to do? You understand the difference? That's a big difference, right? You know, I, I, well, I just, I just think I'm supposed to do these things. That's the, that's the heart of the mindset that that's kind of says, I have to do this. I have to go to church. I have to give my money. I have to serve. I have to read my Bible. I have to pray. You see the difference in the, in the hearts there, the, difference, the motivation for what you do? See, that's the, that's the things that we have to examine our hearts and why do we do. Do we want to do these things or do we feel like we have to do these things? In the book of Malachi, God made it very clear how much he despised his people just going through the motions. All right, Malachi uh, 1.10 says, Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Right? Y'all see what God's saying there? He's saying, I would rather you, I'd rather you just stay home than go through the motions. I'd rather you just stay home, watch TV, go fishing, go do whatever you do. Don't come here going through the motions. Don't come here, don't come into my home, my house, come to the temple, come to the place of worship and just sit there and, and be thinking about something else. I'd rather you just stay home. Half-hearted, passionless, cold, dead, checkbox religious activity is a sure way to kill any chance of revival here. And so let's be careful. Let's be careful that that doesn't happen. The second way we can kill revival at Occupy number two is we hear the word but fail to do the word. We hear the word, but fail to do the word. Look, it's wonderful. We are so blessed here to have so many opportunities to study the word, right? That we, we have all these opportunities. We have Sunday school and discipleship training, preaching hour, extra Bible studies. And then, and of course, the most important of all, personal Bible study, because I know you're reading at home and studying at home. I hope you are. And it's great. It's great that you do all these things. But hear me, right? Do it all. Do all these things. But you must do what it says. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
See, right here in what Paul is saying, there's two things here. To study, right? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to study to rightly divide the Word. But then there's also another step to it that we miss out many times. Apply it. Apply the Word. Apply it. Be a worker of the Word. That's what he's saying here. To be a worker is implying doing. Uh, Reading, studying, and then you apply the Word of God. That's what we're called to do. And here's the test for you in this, to examine yourselves. Are you applying what you are learning? Or, or, or are you content with simply knowing the Word? Because sometimes we'll do that. You know, we'll have, again, we'll, we'll study our Bible, and we'll do our lessons, and we'll highlight everything, and we'll have a yearly be, uh, Bible reading plan. That's great to keep you on track, and we'll do all these things. But then you start to ask in yourself, am I doing what it says? Right? I, I'm ready for, for Bible quiz bowl championship. Right? I can, I can quote verses. I can recall Scripture and all these things. But the bottom line is, are you doing what it says? Are you submitting yourself fully to the Word of God? Right? All this, the Bible that you're filling your head with, are you filling your heart with it? Is it making a difference in your life? And so that's the test here. See, if you're not doing the Word, then you're, not just, uh, then, then you're just showing that you do not know the Word as well as you think you do. Because some would say, well, I know the Word very well. I'm very, I'm very knowledgeable of the Word of God. But then I say, observing, observing your life, you're not doing what it says. If you're not doing what you said, you don't know the Bible as well as you think you do. Because if you knew the Bible you know, like you think you do, you'd be doing what the Bible tells you to do. Right? Do you see the connection? Right? You're not as mature as you think you are. You, you may have a bunch, of, a bunch of it up here, but it hasn't made it here, and it hasn't made it here. Right? It hasn't made it to your hands, and it hasn't made it to your feet. So we must apply the Word to our lives. Listen to what James says in James 1, 22, 24. He says, But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was right that's what what james is saying is it doesn't make any sense it's like you walk to a mirror and you observe yourself and as soon as you turn your back and walk over the mirror you forget what you look like it's kind of pointless is what he's saying right it's like hearing the word it's reading the word and not doing what it says it's pointless what is the point Right, that God's not just looking for us to fill our heads with his word. He's looking for us to fill our heads and our hearts and then do something with it. He's not going to ask you how much Bible did you know. He's going to ask you how much Bible did you do. Right, how much did you live out your faith? You know, great, wonderful, study, 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 but then go, go, go. Do, do, do. That's the whole point of what we do here. To know what the Bible says to do and not to do is a sure way to kill any chance of revival here. Why, why would God send revival to a, to a church or to a person who has no intention on doing anything with the revival? Right? It, it's kind of like with your children, right? You, you know how your children were when they're young, and you may have some that are still picky eaters, that, that you'll serve them a meal, and you'll have a full plate of food, and they'll kind of pick at it a little bit, pick at it a little bit, and they'll turn their nose up, and I don't want to eat that. Right, or they'll say they're full, and so you put the, put the plate to the side, and, and what do they say? As soon as you move the plate out of the way, I'm hungry. I'm hungry, right? You're not hungry. You just don't want, you don't want to eat what I'm giving you, and that's the same way we are with revival with God. So you, you, you're saying you want more and more and more, but you, you haven't done nothing what I've given you already. I will not give you more. I'm not going to send revival on a dead church that don't, want, don't plan on doing anything, right? Why would I do that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send revival on the people who actually want to serve and be the church, right? And so for us to, to, to check ourselves and our motivations. And the third way that we can kill revival at Occupy number two before it even starts is that we refuse to deal with sin in our midst, right? That's a big one. That's a real big one, that we refuse to deal with sin in our midst. It's, it's silly to think that Jesus would bless us with revival while we refuse to deal with the very thing that he came to set us free from, Right? I mean, honestly, just, just logically speaking, why, why would he want to send revival to a, a place that we're not ser- taking sin seriously? See, that unconfessed sin of any kind will stop a revival dead in its tracks. All of us, as a church or as individuals, it works the same way. You think about we, if you have unresolved bitterness, right, unresolved bitterness with anyone, it don't even have to be amongst church members. It could be someone in your family or, or some that you work with or, or, or anywhere. If you have unresolved bitterness in your heart, it, it will stop revival. Secret sin, all right, secret sin that you haven't dealt with that nobody knows about except you and God. And you don't even think he knows about it, but he does. And he wants to forgive you for it if you would ask. Gossip, 
disunity or even open hostility and mean-spirited attitudes towards other people or, 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 or fellow church members. All these things can, can, can get in the way of revival uh, coming here. See, some of us have not experienced true personal revival because we're not willing to deal with sin in our own lives. Right? That, that we have never really experienced true personal revival because we, haven't never, we don't want to deal with the sin in our own lives. We, we live a double life. When I say a double life, you have the real, the, the, the church you here where we, we'll put on our mask and we'll smile and we'll say, bless your heart and oh, I'm just doing so great and I'm too blessed to be stressed and all these other little corny things that Christians say. But then, then there's the real you when you're not here. The, the real you when you're not here, when you're not pretending, where you don't come here and, and think that you have to pretend that you're just perfect and pretend that, that you have no issues and pretend that your children are wonderful and pretend that you don't have financial issues and pretend and pretend and pretend, right? All these things add up. You're, you, you might be in bondage to sin that Jesus has died to set you free from, that, that we're afraid that people will judge us and be unforgiving if we confess. You know who tells you that? The enemy. The enemy wants you to believe that. The enemy wants you to hold that in and not tell anyone. We don't want people to think that we're sinners. Isn't that funny? That we don't want people to think that we're sinners. Let me let, me let you in on a little something. Look to your right, look to your left. Sinners all around. Every one of us in this room, sinners. Every single one of us in this room are sinners that are saved by grace or in need of God's grace. And we're going to struggle with sin until we die. 1 John 1 uh, 8 through 10 says this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. See, God knows already. He's, he's prescribed a way for us to deal with our sins, that we confess our sins, and He will forgive us of our sins. See, and many of our churches have not experienced true revival because we are not willing to confront sin in others. We just look the other way, right? If, if, if we were to have a, a moment where we would all be honest, that we would say we know that, that, that in somebody in our lives, somebody in this church, that's, you, you know of somebody that's dealing with something, some type of sin, but, but you just won't enter in. You won't confront. You won't, you won't say anything about it. You just look the other way. And maybe you'll pray for them, but you won't go to them and confront them about that sin and love. And that's what we're supposed to do. The Bible tells us that, that we're supposed to do that. Matthew 18 tells us how to, how to deal with sin amongst the brothers and sisters in the church. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or, more, one or two more that by the three witnesses uh, every word may be established and if he refuses to hear them tell it to the church but if he refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector the bottom line is we're all in this together right we are as, as a, we, we I, I call you my forever family because you are my forever family and we are in this together all of us everything that we do affects the other what, what I do affects you and what you do affects me, both for the good and for the bad, that we celebrate one another's victories and we mourn one another's losses, right? That we hurt together and we celebrate together. We, we suffer the effect of one another's sin as well. In the book of Revelation, Jesus made it clear how he would deal with a church that did not deal with sin in its midst. A, a church that a, a appeared to be fine and everything was going just the way it should be or, or everything looked normal. And, and, and just say for our, our day and age, we can say, you know, Sunday school was, go, was going good and, and discipleship was good and church attendance was, was regular. Everything seemed to be just fine on the surface, but it wasn't because they were, this church refused to confront sin. The, the, lukewarm, the lukewarm church of Laodicea is the one I want us to look at tonight or this morning. Revelation three fourteen to 21. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the uh, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the uh, creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich 
have become wealthy and have a need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see and many as I love, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You see verse 20. Look at verse 20 again. This is revival. This is Jesus' invitation to revival. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That's what we're looking for. That's the the invitation for revival in our lives. See, a church that is comfortable in mediocrity will not see revival. It it, it just won't happen. They will not see revival. That a, A lukewarm church will not see revival. That we must be a church that takes sin seriously and be sure to deal with it graciously. Right? Deal with it graciously. We're not, we're not like the sin Nazis. We don't take pleasure in going around pointing out other people's sins. Right? It, it's heartbreaking. It's difficult. We, we should have no joy in going, uh, going to a brother or sister and saying, look, I love you. I, I, I love you, but we, we must deal with this. I, you know, that, that I love you too much to let you continue in this sin. I'm calling you to repent for your, for your sake and for the sake of our church. Would you please repent of this? That's what we're called to do. Ignoring personal sin and sinning to others in our faith family is a sure way to kill any chance of revival here at Occupy 2. It's a sure way. So that's three ways. There's many, many more, but that's, those are just three big ones and three common ones that, that I've experienced in my own life and that what I've seen happen. And so as we close our time this morning, some of you are thinking, uh, that was a pretty negative message to lead in our revival meeting, right? You're probably sitting there saying, that wouldn't really uh, uh, feel good. I'm, I'm feeling pretty bad about myself leading in a revival. Good. Good. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm that, that, that hopefully that, that the Holy Spirit is starting to work in your life and starting to reveal some things in your life that you need to deal with, some attitudes that you may have or some sin that you haven't confessed yet. And that, that means that the Lord is, is, is working in you. But we must truly prepare ourselves for revival if we hope to see revival, right? We do. We really have to do the foundational work, the groundwork, that we can go year after year having these same meetings and never uh, see revival and never understand why, right? Listen, God's not the problem in revival. We're the problem. We're the problem. God would love to see us to be revived, a vibrant church, a vibrant people. And so... Uh, I want to be revived. I don't, I don't want to be one that's going to look back and say, what happened? I don't, want, I don't want that for myself, and I don't want that to be for our church. You see, if we truly want to see revival, if we truly want to be renewed by God, that, that let's not kill it before it even begins. Let's make sure that we're not just going through the motions, right? That, 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 oh, it's time for revival meetings, and so we get to go to church three, three nights during the week, and you know, blah, 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 and then next year we'll do the same thing. Let's not go through the motions. Let's make sure that we're not just hearing the word but, and not doing what the word of God says. Let's make sure that we're not just ignoring our sin and the sin around us, right? Let's, let's be sure to deal with our sin. And so today, as I, I said when we first started, we was going to end the service a little differently this, this week. And so for our invitation, uh, I have some music I'm going to play uh, for us just over the speakers and uh, going to give you some time to, to do some soul searching and some business with God on your own. And I didn't want our musicians to have to, to, to participate or, or to play because I want them to be able to, to, to uh, participate in this time of repentance as well, this, this time of re- reflection. So I didn't want them to be distracted with trying to uh, play their instruments and so they'll be able to do these things. And so for what this is, is we're going to, uh, here shortly, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to pray for us first and then we're going to enter into a time of, of prayer for you yourself to, 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 to really do business with God, to confess any known sin that you may have to God. It's, it's time to do that, you know, that uh, you, you confess it to Him and ask for forgiveness, to ask God to reveal any hidden sin in your life, right? There may be things that you don't even realize you're doing, and you ask God to reveal it, to point these things out to you, and I promise you He'll do it. And it's also a time for, for, for you 
uh, to reconcile with whoever you have wronged or maybe hurt. You know, if, there, if there's somebody here in, the, in our midst, in the congregation, this would be a great time to, to go to that individual and, and be reconciled. And so uh, I'm not sure how the Lord will move you to, to respond in this ex- extended time of prayer here at the end, but, but please take advantage of it. Please take advantage of it that, that you'll do business with God and, and he'll be gracious to, to meet you where you are. And I invite you, too, to just take as long as you need. Uh, and, and so that, that's important. Don't rush through this. We're not in a, any hurry. If you have to leave, if there's a need that you have and you have to, leave, to, to go, that's okay, too. But just, just try to make your way out quietly and try not to disturb anybody and, and make your way out, and that'll be fine. And so uh, that's the game plan. That's how we're going to close. And if, if you would like me to pray with you or somebody else to pray with you, please grab a hand, and, and I would love to pray with you. Uh, and also, I know there may be some here today. I, I know I've spoken, like, straight to the church. I've, I've spoken nothing to but the church as though everyone in this room is saved. But I also know that that's not po- probably true. There are some here that don't know Jesus Christ. And so uh, even though I was speaking to the church and, t- and I spoke to everyone as, as though everyone is saved here, I know that, that God can still work in this mission. If, if God is moving on your heart to to want to wanna know who he is, the, this forgiveness that you hear people talk about, this love of Jesus Christ, the, the blood and the forgiveness and repentance of sins, if, if the Lord is leading you to make a decision to follow after him, to repent of your sins and to come to him th- for salvation and eternal life, uh, please Make that decision today. And, and again, I'll be down front in, in, during this time, and I'll be examining my own heart. And if look, if I'm on my knees and I wait, I, I want to talk to you. Because, but I need to do business with the Lord too. But just let's make sure that before we leave today that we handle business before we ask God to come bring revival to this church. Amen? That sound good? All right, let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you for this day. Lord, we want to be revived. We, we, we know it. Lord, this whole community knows it. Lord, we, we schedule these meetings, Father, and we pray and we seek your face, God. But sometimes we just don't do the work uh, beforehand, Lord, that we uh, go through the motions and that we, we ask that you would revive us, but we're not willing to, do with, uh, to deal with sin in our lives, Father. We're not willing to reconcile broken relationships and that we're not, uh, you know, we will not humble ourselves, Father. And so, Lord, I pray that that as we close this time this morning, Father, that we have a freedom before you, but freedom before your cross to, to come this morning, God, and, and be transparent before you, God. We're not telling you anything that you don't know already. Lord, so don't let us worry about what other people think. Let us not be constrained or restricted by, by the opinions of men. Father, that we would, you would reveal in us the, the, the things that displease you, the things that, that we uh, uh, maybe have forgotten about, maybe attitudes or, 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 or attitudes uh, and actions that we have committed that are, are sinful and that are, are hurtful to us, hurtful to our church, but hurtful to you. So God, I pray for courage for, for all here this morning, Lord, that, that they would do business with you and that we would be truly be a revived people for your glory and for your honor and for your purposes. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.